G'day everyone, welcome back to the True Footy YouTube channel for another trade update. We're uh, not really in the midpoint of the trade period, but uh, we finally had a breather. It's uh, It's been one week of trades, so in today's video I'm going to go through the trades that have happened uh, before, you know, there's another three days next week, I believe it concludes Wednesday evening, where a whole heap of other deals still have to get done. But we have seen a fair amount of action take place over the first five days. It was particularly quiet Thursday, Friday, but nonetheless, I'm going to go through the deal that have happened both free agency and pick swaps and everything and run through my thoughts on each individual one. I will be doing a video again this weekend uh, looking at the deals that haven't happened yet thus far in the trade period. To be honest it's nice to have a break uh, in between all the action as well and honestly I've had personally a hectic week um, so I'm glad to have a couple of days where there's no potential deals and we can just talk about what's happened and what is yet to come. It occurred to me the other day as well, we have gone two years now where we've been sponsored by Manscaped as well. They've been a wonderful sponsor. So again, make sure you do yourselves a favor and check out their website for all their male grooming products, for everything to the you know ball and chest hair trimmer, to their consumables as well, like the ball toner, the ball wipes, which I've also got here. And uh, they've got boxes, they've got shampoo, they've got heaps of stuff there as well. So you can get 20% off and free shipping on any of their products on their website if you use the code TRUEFOOTY20. Please enjoy. Anyway, let's crack into the list of deals that went down last week. We'll start with the free agency moves. It all kicked off with Carl Amon joining Hawthorne from Port Adelaide. And as compensation, Port Adelaide received pick 27. So Hawthorne, it's funny to get a read on their list at the moment. They're still sort of going through that transition, uh, looking to offload um, Tom Mitchell, potentially this trade period. Uh, they obviously cut Tom Phillips as well. So they get a slightly younger version of a guy in his prime in Carl Amon, who's had some pretty good years on Port Adelaide's wing there. So for a free agency move, it's a great pickup for them. The Power then traded pick 27 that they received as compensation for Melbourne's 33 and 43. From my perspective, 27 hasn't quit uh, bouncing around. I think it'll actually go to Collingwood for Brody Grundy, but we'll talk about that in another video. West Coast Eagles signed Jaden Hunt from Melbourne, which I thought was interesting for a 27 year old to be joining a side that um, has been outspoken about rebuilding. I think from Hunt's perspective, I presume he's on more money than he would be at Melbourne, probably got more years on his contract. And for us, even though maybe the demographic seems weird, I think the intention is to free up some other players that have been playing in defense for the Eagles, namely Elliot Yo when he's been fit this year, potentially Jermaine Jones, who started his career as a forward and youngster Brady Hoff might sort of be freed up from that halfback line to play some other roles. So happy with that one. In the other free agency moves, the Dogs signed their former player, Liam Jones, uh, from Carlton, who probably see that as a win because previously wasn't sure whether they were going to get any sort of pick for a guy that sort of retired due to the vaccination rules. On the flip side, though, the Dogs lose Zane Cordy to St Kilda as well, so their compensation is cancelled out. But the Blues end up with pick 49 out of that, and of course, St Kilda gain Zane Cordy. Dan McStay, prior to this period, was projected to be uh, the main free agency move, or at least the headline move. He joins Collingwood, um, but the Lions will probably be a little bit disappointed that they didn't get uh, pick 16 or 17 as compensation, whatever they were originally thinking. Instead, it's banned two or three uh, McStay generated for them. So they got pick 35, and the awkward part about that is it kind of has implications on the Josh Dunkley deal. But again, we'll talk about that in another video. To start the actual trade period, GWS obviously fired off a couple of players to Victorian clubs. We know about Bobby Hill. That got done for a future second, so Collingwood adds some uh, not really mature, but somewhat mature forward line depth. So you'd imagine they'd make a spot for him in their best 22 as well. So a, another sort of attacking option alongside Ginevan in that forward line. Taranto also left GWS and joined Richmond for picks 12 and 19. And you don't need me to tell you how much of a big recruit that is for Richmond. Taranto obviously walks into any side's midfield pretty much in the competition. And for Richmond, that was probably the glaring weakness in their list as well. So they're obviously gearing up for another premiership assault. And they've got Jacob Hopper as well and, and this kind of makes it a little bit awkward to get the hopper deal done it sounds like a deal will get done again we'll talk about that in another video but it might mean they need to stump up someone like Ivan Soldo to get that done Blake Akers also left Fremantle this trade period along with uh, a couple of other players but he's joined Carlton for a future third round pick which is probably unders for the quality that Blake Akers displayed this year but essentially he was getting lowballed uh, from Fremantle's perspective we probably have other priorities this offseason namely you know signing Luke Jackson for for a start and obviously their midfield is starting to thicken out with the, some of the draft picks they've taken. So you can understand why from Fremantle's perspective, he wasn't high on the priority list. And as such, they weren't able to offer, you know, a contract sort of more befitting to his talents. So Carlton pick up a very, very good key depth player, I would say 
for them. They're sort of obviously trying to consolidate some depth. We know their top end talent's great. They're sort of, you know, pulling in individual awards left, right, and center over the last couple of years. So to really pad out that midfield with some experience and a decent player in Blake Akers, I think this is a big win for Carlton here. Joining the Fremantle Exodus, we know that Griffin Logue and Darcy Tucker also joined North Melbourne from Fremantle. Fremantle got North Melbourne's future second pick that was uh, sort of given to them by the AFL and the future fourth pick as well that they gained in the same way. It's worth noting as well that that future second is North Melbourne's future second. So, you know, if they finish, you know, bottom two again, that's a top 20 pick. It's also worth noting that part of that deal as well, that the two clubs swapped third rounders, which means that now Fremantle has Norths, which is almost going to be an entire round better than their third round pick as well. If you assume that Fremantle is going to do well next year and North Melbourne won't. But North Melbourne ticked the box of getting some mature talent. They needed a key defender. Griffin Logue wanted to play as a key defender. He's getting better money, you'd presume. And again, same as the Acres situation, Darcy Tucker's not a high priority sort of player for Fremantle to keep. So North Melbourne ticked the box of getting some experience without really touching their first round picks. Then there was a pick swap. The Lions traded back from 15 and 21 to gain an extra second rounder next year from GWS. This would have pissed off the dogs who were probably holding out for pick 15 and a future first for Dunkley. And that makes it a little bit awkward, but obviously the Lions now are consolidating picks to get their father-son picks in Will Ashcroft and Jasper Fletcher. Then with the GWS second rounder that the Lions got from this swap, they traded to the Suns. Again, this was just to get some more points in this year's draft. So they traded that future second for picks 25 and 36 this year. So they're really accumulating those second rounders to match bids for both of these players. The Suns also received Tom Berry as part of that deal. I think they said, you know, losing Isaac Rankin and losing a pressure forward, they wanted to get, um, well, let's say a cheap one as a replacement. In addition to getting Tom Berry, the Suns also traded for the mature Ben Long from St Kilda. The Suns gave up pick 32 for Ben Long and received a future fourth rounder because then again the Suns are trying to accumulate points in next year's draft and they don't have the list spots to take all of their second rounders this year so they're pushing them into the future and also gaining a couple of sort of mature players in Ben Long and Tom Berry. On the whole I think from a St Kilda perspective even though Ben Long played 19 games this year pick 32 is probably a fairly solid offer for a player of his talents. The Suns then opened up another list spot by trading Josh Corbett to Fremantle for a future fourth round pick. Corbett played 16 games in 2021, but just the four this year, and he's out of contract. So this was always just gonna be a token spot. From Fremantle's perspective, they're obviously just looking to consolidate some key forward depth. Obviously that's part of the ground that they're somewhat weak in. Yes, you've got Tabana, but then backing up that is uh, Josh Tracy, Jai Amos, a couple of young guys in there. So Corbett just sort of adds to that depth without being a real headline trade. The Cats then did very well, in my opinion, by trading pick 18 to the GWS Giants for Tanner Braun, who is of course a first round draft pick for a couple of years ago. This is a great pickup for the Premiers, obviously looking to replenish their list a little bit. Joel Selwood's retired. Tanner Brun is a 20 year old first round draft pick from two years ago, like I said, he's played 30 games. Is he gonna be the next Joel Selwood? Probably not, but what they've done is nabbed a former first round draft pick who's been developed for a couple of seasons, wants to play at the club. And Geelong are really benefiting from this environment where players want to come play for them. We talked about this a little bit on the podcast before, but Geelong do have this advantage and some of it is inherent and some of it's earned. Part of that inherent advantage is that they're the one sort of country Victorian club and that part of the country seems to produce a fair bit of talent. So when players from country Victoria want to come home, Geelong sort of looms as one of the best destinations for them from a homesick perspective. Then of course, obviously there's the culture that they've developed there, the, the period of success that they've had over the last 15 years. If you're a young guy heading to Geelong, you'd feel fairly comfortable that they develop you right and you'd be giving yourself the best opportunity to sort of fulfill your potential. So Tanner Bruns identified that, Oliver Henry's identified that, Jack Bowes has identified that potentially as well. And that's a guy who's not from that part of the world at all. So Geelong have the potential here to really make out like bandits this trade period by getting, you know, three potentially best 22 players or guys that are going to be in that sort of best 25 bracket with the potential to move in fairly soon. And then of course, they're probably going to end up with pick seven. And if... <laughs> If the trade hypotheticals come true about West Coast splitting pick two, I can't help but notice that Geelong are going to add those three players, have won a premiership, and then still pick before West Coast in the draft. So that is great. And the final piece of business that happened this week was again involving Geelong. They traded four picks, if I'm reading that correctly, for Brisbane's pick 25 this year. So it was pick 25 for pick 38, 48, and 55 this year. 
and a future second round pick. So again, Geelong obviously not intending to sort of draft deep, considering how many players they've traded in this trade period, or at least intend to. And again, Brisbane accumulating those points to match their father-son bids. In my opinion, this pick 25 probably finds its way to Collingwood for Ollie Henry as well. So the Cats could potentially have traded in Bruin, Bowes, and Henry, and obviously potentially pick at pick seven in this year's draft if they don't on trade it. And they've also haven't touched next year's first rounder as well. So gee, it's a good time to be a Geelong fan. So there it is guys. That is pretty much my brief summary uh, or the snapshot of all the deals that have happened so far. There's still a fair bit to unpack in the final three days of trade period. I'm looking forward to it. As I said, it was a quiet Thursday, Friday. I think we're bracing for a pretty big last three days of the trade period. We did say that last year as well and it didn't come true, but I feel like this year, some of these deals definitely have to get done so as i said i will be doing a video sort of projecting next week and what's that going to look like obviously there's been mooted six sort of team mega trades i don't know if i can break down all the mechanics of that but i'll run through all the deals that need to get done and how i think they might get done so thanks for watching guys stay tuned to the channel for more content and i'll see you in the next video cheers